Let's read. Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus, so that if he found any there who belonged to their way, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. As he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul said. I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. He replied, Now get up and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. The men traveling with Saul stood there speechless. They heard the sound but did not see anyone. Saul got up from the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he could not see nothing. So they led him by the hand into Damascus. For three days he was blind and did not eat or drink anything. He see it? God is good. All the time. All the time. <clears throat> now today's passage is telling us Saul's extraordinary encounter with Jesus. It led him to the dramatic conversion from the one who hated Jesus most to a person who loved him to death. From the one who believed Jesus was one of the most notorious impostors to an adamant believer in Jesus as the Son of God. His zeal for his religious belief and for God had served was so great that he asked the high priest to authorize him with a letter to chase after all the Christ followers to the end of the world and bring them to Jerusalem and keep them in jail or even kill. Now, having the letter of authorization, Saul was on his way to Damascus. He was in the front line in persecuting Christians because he hated Jesus and his followers. Why did he hate Jesus? Because he did not understand Jesus. He was blinded by his religious conviction and self-righteousness from jealously keeping the law. He believed that Jesus was destroying the traditional value of the national religious system. He also, also thought that Jesus was uh, endangering the identity of the Jews as the covenant children of God, namely the people belonging to the kingdom of God. Because Jesus said, unless you are born of water and spirit, you cannot come to the kingdom of God. Saul had believed that being born as Jews, the offspring of Abraham, privileged to have the law of Moses, which was functioning as the demarcation between them and the Gentiles, was good enough to be the people of the kingdom of God. But Jesus taught that being born as a physical Jews does not automatically qualify you to belong to the kingdom of God. The only way is to be born again of water and spirit. And the biggest reason why Saul hated Jesus and the church was perhaps because Jesus kept teaching his divine authority, saying, 
I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. Besides, Jesus made the self claim to be equal with God. So John chapter 10, 30 says, I and my Father are one. I and my Father are the same, are one. So that way, he made the self claim to be equal with God. So that's why <clears throat> Saul hated Jesus so much. For Saul, whose worldview had been shaped by and anchored in the fundamental Judaism, Jesus claim to the divine authority and divinity was understandably blasphemous. So he believed that persecuting the church was a good way to please and honor God. Saul did not call the believers of Jesus Christians yet. He called the believers of Jesus rightly the followers of the way. We Christians are indeed the followers of Jesus, the way. The way is not referring to Christianity as a religion, but as life that all people should live. We the belief, so the belief in Jesus, the way, is not a mere practice of religion, but the way to live a life that keeps enjoying the way to blessings, the way to peace, the way to joy, the way to healing, the way to eternal life, and the way to the kingdom of God. So, rejecting the way worse, hating and persecuting the way, and those who were of the way was on his way to Damascus. It was when he was near Damascus that the light brighter than the midday light flashed around him and the voice like a thunder was heard. Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? The voice was so thunderous that, you know, all of them Saul and his companions fell to the ground. Fell to the ground, you know? That's the, what's going to happen. All will prostrate before the presence of God. When we see the presence of God, when we hear the voice of God, we creatures are to fall to the ground. As I reflect on the account of Saul's extraordinary encounter with Jesus, I've come to learn a couple of lessons from it. So I want to share with you. Now, Jesus identified himself with his believers. That's one as I learned. Jesus identified himself with his believers. Jesus, calling Saul's name twice, said, Why do you persecute me? Saul, and calling again, Saul, why are you persecuting me? You know, Saul never had persecuted Jesus personally. But Jesus was saying he did by hurting the believers in him. Jesus identified himself with the church. The church is the body of Christ, which is referred to as a community of all believers, where they are loving one another and taking care of one another. So, persecuting the church is to persecute Jesus, the Son of God that Jesus is identified with the church also means that 
he also is identified with individual Christians. It means that what you do to the believing brothers and sisters is what exactly you do to Jesus. So the way you show your love to Jesus is to love the believing brothers and sisters. That is what Jesus means when he said in Matthew chapter 25, verse 37 and following, Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in, or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick, or in prison and go to visit you? The king will reply, Truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. And in Matthew chapter 5, 22. But I tell you that anyone who is angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. Again, anyone who says to a brother or sister, Rekha, is answerable to the court. Rekha means a fool. And anyone who says, you fool, will be in danger of the fire of hell. So it can be said that the persecution against Jesus is not just committed by those with other religious conviction in practicing a violence against the church, systemically and systematically. It can be committed unwittingly within the body of Christ. If you don't love our brothers and sisters purchased with the blood of Lord Jesus Christ. So we should be careful to love one another. When we look at the believing brothers and sisters at the church, you are not just looking at them as different individuals. But Jesus, who is identified with them. Now, what is implied in Jesus calling Saul's name twice is that anyone who persecutes the church, the body of Christ, is surely committing one of the greatest sins against God. When Jesus wanted to display his deep, Emotion toward the one in wrong direction ways, away from the presence of God, he called a name twice. Jesus calls Saul, Saul, as he is in a wrong way. In Luke chapter 10, verse 41, Jesus calls the Martha, Martha, the name Martha, Martha twice, with a deep emotion to correct her from worrying about too many things. And he calls Jerusalem, Jerusalem, twice in Matthew 23, 37, as he, as he forces its total destruction because of her unfaithfulness. By calling her name twice, he displays his compassionate emotion toward this one, the ones that are doing wrong, doing things wrong things, that they be corrected, they turn around and come to the presence of God and know the truth of God. Our Lord Jesus called the name so twice with the deep and compassionate emotions for him. While he was committing the greatest sin and persecuting him, the same Lord is still calling all sinners' name twice with the same compassionate emotion for them to be saved. Now, second, the reflection I want to share with you is that for life, 
There are three fundamental questions. Who is God? Who am I? What should I do? Now these questions, Jesus only is the answer. Now we hear Paul's testimony of his supernatural encounter with Jesus presented to his fellow Jews in chapter 22, verse 8 and following. Who are you, Lord? I ask. I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom you are persecuting, he replied. My, compassion, my companions saw the light, but they did not understand the voice of him who was speaking to me. What should I do, Lord? I asked. Get up, the Lord said, and go into Damascus. There you will be told all that you have been assigned to do. Now the question, what should I do? In chapter 22 is what we done here in today's passage. In today's passage we done here the question, what should I do? He so only asked, who are you, Lord? Who are you? So Saul asked God two questions. Who are you, God? And what should I do? But another important question is implicit along with these two questions. Who am I? Who are you, Lord? The question is asking who and what is God? To this question, God is answering, I am Jesus. God who appeared to his forefathers, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Moses, as I am, Yahweh, is clearly revealing himself to be Jesus. God, who is I am, is saying, I am Jesus. Upon seeing the revelation of God as Jesus, who shared the physical time and space temp contemporary to him, he has come to know that the infinite God, the Creator, has indeed come to the world, making himself seen, touched, talked by his creation. When he hears God saying, I am Jesus, it was the moment when Saul came to understand that God is indeed love. God is so loving us that he has come incarnated in the flesh in order to die for our sins. Saul has come to understand who and what God really is. God is Jesus who demonstrated his infinite love through death on the cross. Mm -hmm. Knowing who God also gives the answer to the question, who am I? As said, God is Jesus who is the revelation of God's infinite love and the grace for us sinners. If God loves us, uh, loves us while we are still sinners to the extent that he had to come to our salvation, leaving the highest heavenly throne and glory to live in our lowest, filthy, and hopeless place. How worthy are we in the eyes of God? We are so much worthy. God's infinite love for you Defines, defines you as infinite worth. It does not matter whether you are a total failure or great achiever. What really makes you worthy is God's love. You are Jesus' worth. 
It is not too much to say you are as worthy as Jesus. For you are purchased with his precious and priceless blood. Now it answers to the question, who am I? Amen. So, what answers should we give to the question, what should I do? We should live a life worthy of Christ Jesus. Saul, who became Paul after knowing God as Jesus, has come to also know how to live a life worthy of Jesus in the most effective way. It is to live an incarnational and missional life, meaning to follow Jesus' footsteps. It is the life lived to speak Jesus' language, to express Jesus' smile, to demonstrate Jesus' endurance in sufferings, to stretch out Jesus' hands, and to move Jesus' feet. Amen? That is the meaning of life. Today's passage, which gives an account of Saul's supernatural and dramatic conversion by encountering Jesus on his way to Damascus. This gives us these lessons. It gives us teaching that Jesus is the, the ultimate answer to the three fundamental questions. Who God is and who am I? What is the meaning of life? God is love because God loves you so much that he sent his one and only son to you. You are so worthy. You are priceless. What really defines you is not what you are doing, but God's love for you. Amen? Amen. So, we have to live worthy of Lord Jesus Christ. That's the meaning of our life. That's the point. Persecution against Jesus is not just committed by the haters of Jesus only. If you don't love one another as brothers and sisters with whom Jesus is identified, the Lord is viewing it as a persecution against him as well. Also, we should be assured that we are Jesus' worth because he loves us so much that he gave his one and only son to pardon our sins. So, we should be encouraged to live a life worthy of Jesus. Amen? That's what I want to bless you with as I deliver the sermon on today's passage. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your truth that you have come to this world and present Jesus and demonstrate your love. Mm -hmm. And by the love, we truly understand that our true identity is your sons and all your image. And uh, our, the, the worth of our life is priceless and Jesus' worth. So Father, help us to live our life worthy of Lord Jesus Christ, thereby bringing a glory to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.